we have a, a special treat tonight. Um, before we all return to our far spread homes, well, some not so far. <laughs> I think Ling and Michael live a block away. <laughs> yeah. I want to introduce to you our last speaker of the day from a department you haven't yet heard from, Daniel Casasanto, who's an assistant professor of psychology, and he is the director of the Experience and Cognition Lab. He uh, did his PhD at MIT and a postdoc at Stanford, and since then he's been here working on linguistic, cultural, and bodily experiences that shape mind and brain. Tiny topic. Um, so, you know, he's published, I won't say hundreds, but more than 50 articles. Uh, his research is supported by everyone who should be supporting his research. He's really uh, energizing uh, various communities across campus, not only in the social sciences, but also in the humanities, the linguistics department, for example. And so without further ado, Daniel Casasanto. Thank you, David, and thank you all for, for uh, letting me join you. This is very nice. Uh, am I on? No, testing, on. testing, yes. okay. Yes. So uh, as uh, as David mentioned, I'm a cognitive scientist, and uh, as such, I spend a lot of time thinking about thinking about how our minds work and how we come to know what we know. The question I'd like to discuss this evening is one that's been debated for centuries, uh, but I'm pretty sure we can sort it out in the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, the question is, what role does experience play in shaping our brains and minds? Well, the answer should seem obvious, right? Uh, we learn through our experience of interacting with the world through conversation, through play, through art, through sports, through rituals, ideally through talks like this. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, surely what comes in through our eyes and our ears uh, and our hands makes up much of what we have in our minds, right? Well, perhaps surprisingly, this has not been the, the dominant view in the sciences of brain and mind for, for the last several decades. A prevailing view is that regardless of our experiences, uh, that we all share a single universal mind. This idea is linked uh, to a theory proposed by Noam Chomsky, uh, sometimes uh, referred to as the, the most famous guy you've never heard of. Uh, he is, of course, the father of modern linguistics. Prior to Chomsky, lots of people were interested in exploring the diversity of languages, uh, how languages differed in the sounds that people made, the words they had or didn't have, the grammatical structures that they used. Uh, and Chomsky argued that all of this variation between languages is superficial, that underneath, uh, there is a single set of principles that gives rise to the structure of all human language. He called it a universal grammar. Chomsky and his followers generalized this theory uh, beyond language, some suggesting that most of what's interesting about our minds is encoded in the human genome and is therefore universal. The theory of a universal grammar and more broadly of a universal mind has been really, really influential. So an academic's influence is measured uh, by the number of times other writers cite their work. Uh, uh, in order to get in the same ballpark with Chomsky, you have to compare his influence, his citation count, to that of someone like Shakespeare uh, or the Bible, right? Um, uh, so uh, the theory of universal grammar, uh, extremely influential, why? Well, there's no question that this theory is important for scientific reasons. It's elegant, it's comprehensive, it offers potential solutions to some very hard problems. But I wanna suggest that there are also non-scientific social reasons for the success of universalist theories, for, for the, the, the dogma of the universal mind. The founders of my field of cognitive science were children during World War II. The Holocaust is in their living memory. As they were writing their seminal works, the civil rights movement was being born. America was being called upon to remember its commitment to the view that all of us are created equal. This was a really good time for a theory of the human mind that suggests that underneath, despite visible, palpable differences, we're all the same. Our minds are what make us who we are, so if people are all the same, there must be a universal mind, right? Well, here's an alternative. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's consider an alternative a potential reconciliation between universals uh, and experience. Suppose there is, suppose there is a universal starting point to the mind. Babies come with some package of innate knowledge 
and start with a set of principles that guide the way we all learn. Okay? Even if this is true, this universal starting point is where the development of our brains and minds begins. It's not where it ends. The same learning mechanisms operating in different physical and social contexts could give rise to different ways of thinking. Right? In principle, this, this could happen, right? Well, how can we find out whether it does happen? We need to study people with different sets of experiences and find out whether they think differently as a consequence. So as uh, you may uh, no doubt remember, this has been tried uh, in the arena of language, famously or infamously, uh, depending upon who you ask, by an amateur linguist in the 1930s named Benjamin Worf. So Worf asked, does our experience using language influence the way we perceive and understand the world? Seems like an innocent question, right? Worf noted, for example, that the Hopi language differs from English in the way it describes time. And he thought that this linguistic difference must lead the Hopi to conceptualize time differently than we do as English speakers. This idea that language influences the way people think uh, came to be known as linguistic relativity. Uh, perhaps some aspects of the way we think vary relative to the way that we talk. Well, Worf made lots of fascinating observations, but linguistics was just a hobby for him. He published his findings, uh, if he published them at all, in places where they were unlikely to make much of an impact. And yet they've had a huge impact. They ignited an academic firestorm that is still burning today. Why? Well, uh, uh, again, I want to suggest that uh, clearly there are some scientific reasons uh, why people disagreed with Worf. But their qualms about Worf's science don't explain the almost religious fervor with which his ideas have been resisted. Why being called a Worfian is still an epithet in many circles. Um, I want to suggest again that there are non-scientific social reasons why people don't like linguistic relativity. And that they are, in fact, the flip side of the non-scientific social reasons why people do like the doctrine of the universal mind. Worf's claim was that people are not all the same. Human minds differ across groups. Well, this suggestion makes some people feel uncomfortable, especially if one group is less technologically advanced than another, more primitive. Uh, and Worf tried to combat this discomfort by assuring his readers that because of their language, the Hopi were actually capable of more sophisticated thinking than we English speakers. Well, that plan backfired, right? I mean, if, if language can make one group more sophisticated, it can make another group less sophisticated, right? Uh, so uh, this makes people feel uh, uncomfortable. It, it feels distasteful to us it's because it threatens our sense of equality, our commitment to the equality of all people. It threatens this commitment whether or not it's true. So uh, by the end of the 20th century, which is when I started to study cognitive science, Worf had been demonized. The theory of linguistic relativity had been largely dismissed. Uh, I was at this time studying, uh, as David mentioned, at, at, uh, at MIT at Chomsky's home, at the stronghold of the universal mind. And I was an acolyte of some of the champions, some of the high priests of the church of the universal mind, <laughs> right? The champions of the anti-Worfian crusade. I never expected to start studying linguistic relativity, and it happened kind of by accident. Like Worf, I was interested in language and time. Uh, linguists told us that when people talk about time, we can hardly avoid using spatial words, spatial metaphors. So we say things like, I want to take a long vacation. Well, vacations uh, can't be literally long, like a long street or a long ponytail, right? Uh, so uh, people talk about uh, space, uh, uh, excuse me, people talk about time using space. I wanted to find out whether people think about time by creating models of space the way metaphors and language suggest they do. So we gave people a simple time estimation task. Uh, you see, for example, a line that grows across a computer screen. And when it disappears, you have to reproduce how much time it stayed on the screen. Uh, participants in these experiments do this for line after line after line. Uh, and their job is to ignore the spatial length of the line and just reproduce its duration in time, right? Well, they can't do this, right? You can't ignore space. Lines that traveled a farther distance were judged to take a longer time. Long, lines that traveled a shorter distance to take a shorter time, even though this wasn't true. On average, all of these lines took the same amount of time. 
Uh, so this was news because it was some of the first evidence that people don't just talk about uh, time using space, they also think about time using space. I assumed that this was a human universal, right? That durations are long or short in language and in thought due to the very nature of time itself, right? The arrow of time, the linear extent of time uh, that uh, as physicists have described it to us. A Greek speaker made me question this assumption. So I was in Greece one summer uh, presenting this research at a, at a meeting and boldly asserting that across languages, people import the structure and the content of a spatial phrase like a long rope into the domain of time and use expressions like a long meeting. Uh, and my data here show that uh, people think about it accordingly. Uh, and a, a Greek speaker uh, raised her hand uh, and said, look, uh, that's not how we talk about time in Greek. And that's not how I think about it. In Greek, there are no long meetings. There are only big meetings. <laughs> so uh, she, she went on to explain that Greek talks about time using a different spatial metaphor. Rather than saying a long night, Greek speakers would say a big night, big in three-dimensional space like a big building. Rather than saying a long party, Greek speakers say a party that lasts much. The word for much also describes spatial quantities like much water. Uh, so uh, uh, at this point, a Hindi speaker in the audience there in Greece uh, raises his hand and says, I believe that my language is like Greek. We too use three-dimensional space for time. If you tell me that a meeting is halfway over, I imagine a liter bottle full of Coca-Cola that is halfway full. Boy, I don't think that's what I do. Is that, is that, what, is that what you do? Uh, so the question is, is that what they do, right? Uh, well, I'm so grateful to whoever this Hindu, Hindi speaker was because his comment suggested an experiment that changed the course of my research and eventually of how I think about the human mind. We made a three-dimensional analog of this growing line task, right? People saw a container gradually filling up with water and reproduced how much time it remained on the screen, ignoring how full it was, right? Uh, and uh, if Greek and English speakers think about time the way they talk about it, using different kinds of space, then this should be evident in their non-linguistic duration reproduction in these, in these experiments. Uh, 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 the alternative, of course, is that whatever effect the lines and the containers have on people's time estimates, it should be the same across groups. Why? Because differences across languages are superficial. Underneath where it counts, people's basic temporal thinking should be the same universally, right? Shaped by the physics of the, of the body and of the world. This was the outcome I expected and I was totally wrong persistently wrong. Uh, the data turned out just the way language predicted over and over. We kept doing experiments until it became undeniable that people with different experience using language uh, were thinking about time differently. Uh, thinking about time may be a human universal, but the way we think about time depends on the languages that we speak. So these data vindicate Worf and the idea of linguistic relativity, uh, and happily they help to address some of the social discomfort that some people feel about relativity research. Overall, people's time estimates across groups were about equally accurate. The English speakers were not better or worse than the Greeks. They just used different kinds of information to form their time estimates. So saying that uh, language causes groups of people to think differently doesn't necessarily mean that it makes one group think better or worse than another. That should be comforting, right? Well, <laughs> that said, if language can cause differences that don't correspond to any value judgment, any, any uh, better, worse kind of difference, couldn't it also cause differences that do? Uh, so uh, there are myriad aspects of language, lots and lots of different aspects of cognition, and countless ways that they can influence each other. Shouldn't we expect, knowing what we now know, uh, that some aspect of language A might enable its speakers to think better by some standard uh, than speakers of language B. Well, uh, if, if this is a, a shocking idea, uh, hold on to your hat because it's not just a hypothetical anymore. There's growing evidence that this is simply a fact of how our minds work uh, and how experience with language can shape our minds. Suppose I show you a plate with four apples on it. 
I take it away, I show you another plate with five apples on it. Could you tell me which plate had more apples on it? Well, of course you could, right? Couldn't anyone, at least any grown-up, tell the difference between four and five apples? The answer appears to be no. <laughs> it appears that you can only reliably tell the difference between four and five of something if you're exposed to a counting system like our number words, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. So this has been shown most compellingly by my colleague uh, in the psychology department, Susan Golden Meadow. Uh, Susan's team has studied number concepts in members of a deaf community in Nicaragua. Some of these people had hearing parents, so they didn't learn a sign language until later in their life, and they never learn to count. When you're, when you're a grown up, people don't play counting games with you. Well, they also appear to have no concepts of exact numbers greater than three or four. If you hold up uh, seven fingers and ask them to do the same, they'll hold up approximately seven, maybe seven, right? But maybe six, maybe nine. If you drop eight nuts into a can, right? And ask them to do the same with their can, they'll drop in approximately eight nuts. Uh, but that's the best that they can do. Uh, these are intelligent, fully functional adults who have families, who hold jobs, and who are members of a society of counters where there's clearly incentive to deal with exact number. And yet, without number words, these people live in a world of approximate quantities, apparently unable to think a thought like exactly 17 or even exactly 5. Why does this matter? Well, here's an example of how language can cause differences between minds with far-reaching implications. Exact number concepts don't just allow us to count apples. Uh, they are the basis for our ability to do math, right? Uh, and math is the basis for our technological world. The cars we drive, the phones in our pockets, the lights over our head, uh, much of life as we know it depends on people's ability to use exact number, which in turn depends on our experience with words. So uh, experience with this particular aspect of language can radically change our minds. And in this case, many people would say for the better. Better, that is, by our culture's standards, uh, because we value the things that numbers let us accomplish. Uh, this includes uh, uh, some things that, that may be universally valued, like uh, uh, treating cancer, uh, but also some other things like inventing Xbox uh, that are not part of other cultures, clearly not valued universally, valued uh, to us. Um, Still, compared to these late sign language learners and to members of now uh, several other groups who've been studied who lack number words and number concepts, our numerical thinking is more precise and more powerful and opens up a world of possibilities. This is not because other groups lack the intelligence to, to use numbers. Uh, it is not because of any intrinsic cognitive limitation. It's because they haven't had the critical kind of linguistic experience. We're so strongly convinced that linguistic experience is what matters, is what makes this, 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 this chasm between kinds of minds that Susan Golden Meadow and I have just sent a postdoc down to Nicaragua to teach late sign language learners to count. Because we think they can develop the same kind of number concepts that we have. Now, uh, is this meddling with their culture for our scientific gain? I don't think so. We're teaching them the number words in their local sign language. These are the words that all of their friends use uh, and giving them the same kind of accounting experience uh, that their friends had who, who are counters, uh, the kind of experience that they were deprived of as kids. Our scientific goal is to understand the role that language plays in the development of number concepts. In doing so, we hope to enable these people to participate more fully in their own numerate culture. Uh, so uh, studying cross-linguistic differences and even intervening on cultures in order to learn, uh, learn how things work uh, is not necessarily uh, abusive to members of these cultures. Where does this leave us? People may start off with an innate cognitive endowment and there may be universal principles by which we all learn, but there is no universal mind. Experience changes our minds such that people with different kinds of experience think differently in some ways that are subtle and in some ways that are staggering. 
Language, uh, furthermore, is only one of the streams of experience that shapes our brains and minds. They're also shaped by the, the cultures that we're immersed in and even by the bodies that we use to interact with the world. And yet, the extent of cognitive diversity has remained largely in the realm of the unknown, in part because we're afraid to explore this territory. Why are we afraid to explore it? Well, some people uh, vehemently oppose linguistic relativity research uh, and have made it clear that they do so out of moral obligation, obligation to avoid seeing one group as different from another because that, that might mean that one group is better than another in some way. I wanna suggest that it is our moral obligation not to ignore observable differences. By ignoring differences between individuals and groups, by assuming a universal mind, we forfeit the opportunity to understand more fully how human knowledge is constructed. For instance, uh, a fuller understanding of the role that language plays in uh, learning number concepts could be the key to helping people learn better. Perhaps to closing the math achievement gap that separates different populations within our schools. Our squeamishness about saying that uh, anyone is different from anyone else may have a noble origin it's part of our commitment to equality, which has been a guiding principle for our culture since the Age of Enlightenment. But even if we are all created equal, experience changes us, not necessarily for the better or the worse, just for the different. There's a much older conception of enlightenment, the Buddhist conception, which tells us that the first step to the, uh, on the path to enlightenment includes seeing things as they really are. Not as we assume they are, not as our culture suggests that they should be. In the past, research on linguistic and cultural differences has been abused. It's been used to justify bigotry. It's been used to motivate oppression. Obviously, this is wrong. But the right solution is not to close our eyes and pretend that there are no differences. We can't fight ignorance with ignorance. It's precisely because differences can lead to discrimination that we need to understand them, right? Blinding ourselves to differences doesn't make them go away. It's by recognizing them, by studying them, by understanding their origins and their implications that we can prevent differences between groups from becoming sources of injustice. Some people have denounced the idea of linguistic or cultural relativity because they think it denies a fundamental human nature I wanna suggest just the opposite. Exploring cognitive diversity can help us develop a broader, more inclusive understanding of human nature, one that someday might extend to all humans and not just the ones who think like we do. Thank you. Questions? Please. Mm -hmm. isn't, it, isn't it accurate to say that um, some of this is a cognitive developmental issue and there is a specific point in our development from childhood to adulthood conceptually that we can develop these concepts and after a certain point it is not that easy to differentiate between these concepts? We don't know. What we do know, we, we don't know if there is an upper bound uh, to, to, to if there's a critical period for acquiring these concepts. Uh, I'm betting a, a great deal of effort uh, on, on behalf of my team uh, that there is no upper bound. Uh, uh, we, we have reason to believe that there shouldn't be. Uh, this is something that kids acquire at, uh, over some range of ages. And uh, kids, uh, as, as uh, uh, many of you probably know, kids go through an, a, a very surprisingly long phase where they know the count list. They can say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, but they don't know, and they know that those words correspond to quantities of things, but they don't know which quantities, right? Hand me four grapes, right? You get a handful of grapes. Okay, now hand me five grapes. You get a handful of grapes that may or may not, may not be more than four, right? Uh, it takes kids a long time uh, to go from this external symbol system, these, these words, and map them onto exact quantities they have to create a new cognitive capacity that is different from what we, the ones we share with babies and with non-human animals, uh, and that 
uh, appears to be very recent and rare in the scope of human history. Please. Uh, I'm sorry. No, please. Mm -hmm. There are many cultures that get by just fine without exact number, right? Notice that we're not going into uh, the Amazon uh, and trying to teach tribes that have no words for exact number and no use for exact number how to count. That, arguably, would be exploitation for scientific reasons, right? We're going into a culture where almost all of the adults are numerate. These people were deprived of the, of the kind of experience that we all had as kids. Uh, so, uh, in their culture, it's pretty important. In our culture, everything we see around us exists because of somebody's ability to create and manipulate exact numbers. Please. Uh, more, more by way of a comment than a question. But uh, going to college in the 60s and graduate school in the uh, early 70s and studying uh, biology and psychology both in college and in graduate school. It always struck me as odd that if you look around you in the world, people differ from each other in every conceivable dimension you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Height, eye color, size, weight, skill, ability, personality, anything you can imagine people differ, except this one area. <laughs> We're all the same. Right. <laughs> what, 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 Isn't that something? Yeah, it's okay to, right? Yeah, it's it's okay to note. Pardon? But there are ways. But there are ways in which we are all the same. Certainly. We walk, talk, etc. There are there are commonalities. Absolutely. No, no, no. There are commonalities. We don't all walk the same and talk the same. No, but we all do walk with two legs. Yes, that's right. That's right. So there are certain. Things in common, but not everything. So, so far as we know, uh, for everyone, thoughts are implemented in neurons. Uh, so, so we can agree to some very basic commonalities, <laughs> right? Are you thinking of studying, for example, what occurs to me of relationships and the differences in relationships mm. and the history of relationships? Obviously, would would uh, form one's psyche and one's way of looking at the world very differently. Yeah, so. yeah, that would be fascinating. And, and we're, uh, we're engaged in uh, work on cultural relativity that's not limited to language. Uh, and as we discussed a little over dinner, dinner, bodily relativity, people's bodies differ systematically and that gives rise to differences in their brains and minds. Um, relationships are really interesting, but by, by definition, more complex than studying single people. Uh, so we, we start small. <laughs> Does this mean that in um, different languages, um, children go through the Piagetian conservation stage at different periods? To and my you, knowledge. You might think they would if, if you're. Yeah, yeah. To my knowledge, I don't, I don't know if that's ever been studied. Um, except, again, by, by. I have a dissertation. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, except, uh, again, by Susan Golden Meadow, uh, who studied uh, Piagetian conservation in, in blind kids uh, and found a, a, a lot of commonalities. I, I would have to go back and read the, the, uh, the work to, to uh, recall whether there were any differences noted. Please. Mm. Uh, groundbreaking way of thinking. When I was here, uh, the, um, the war hypothesis really opened my mind to the fact that what you can talk about affects what you think about. Yeah. That was really groundbreaking mm. right for me. That, like, uh, and then uh, Susan uh, Golden Meadows' um, work on you know when you you have a disability of some sort, how that. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can learn is like really amazing. So I just want to kind of talk about uh, U of C and uh, like the innovation that um, the 
we associated with it and the groundbreaking theory, like that, that would, those would be ground um, mind um, changing um, kind of theories. It's a very exciting place to be yeah. for those reasons.